Um, our third speaker before the break is Claudia Kirov. Is that right? Yes. Um, Claudia is the lead fund manager for Quilter Cheviot's sustainable investment strategy. Uh, she was recently shortlisted for a performance award at the Professional Advisors Award Ceremony. She holds an MBE from the Cass Business School in London and is a member of a Chartered Institute for Securities and Investments. Uh, previously, Claudia was with Henderson Global Investors and, jo and joined Quilter Cheviot in 2009. In her spare time, uh, apart from being with her family, she is a keen follower of Mary Berry, who was 80 today, apparently. Um, she is a passionate baker, but also a keen runner. So presumably one activity puts on the pounds and the other takes it off. <laughs> Claudia is going to talk to us about managing investments, in particular sustainable and thematic investments. Claudia. Thank you, thank you, Nick, thank you very much. Um, thank you to all of you for being here and for your interest in sustainable investment. Um, before I tell you um, how we do sustainable investment at Quilt Achievement, I uh, would like to tell you just a little bit about who we are. We are the investment management arm of all mutual wealth. We have a wide presence across the UK. And I personally work in the London office, um, very close walking distance to um, the interesting and ever-changing Covent Garden. And we have offices across uh, the UK to serve our private clients, charity clients, trusts and pension funds. Currently, we manage um, over 17 billion pounds. We have expertise um, in the charity space. We have a dedicated charity, uh, charity team. And we serve charities of all sizes and, and, and types, as you can see in the graph. We also have a sustainable investment team based in London. And we work very closely with the charity team to ensure that um, the portfolios that we manage on behalf of charities are very suitable and they follow the charities' uh, financial and social and economic values. So. Um, what about sustainable investment? What is sustainable investment? And the thing is that while it is a very straight question, it doesn't have an straight answer. I have been involved in managing portfolios on sustainable investment for over 15 years, and I really know that sustainable investment means different things to different people. So what are we going to talk about today is about what it means for us, uh, oh, sorry, what it means for us as Quilt Achievement. Um, let's talk about the sustainable part of sustainable investment, which has a lot to do with sustainability issues. Um, however, sustainability is very complex, and um, I'm going to try to um, make it easier to follow, um, to highlight the key issues about sustainability. And as you know, population is growing faster than any other time before, and most of this growth is coming from the developing world. And that means that um, people living in a develop developing world have rising living standards. They are consuming more services, more products, the basics, more water, more energy, uh, more food. And as you know, um, resources are limited. Supply of resources is a limited availability. And because of climate change, we need to deliver more to more people with less resources and within a carbon-constrained environment. We need to produce more, but we need to cut carbon emissions. So we live in a very challenging environment. And we think at Quilt Achievement that these three macroeconomics are now depending, they underpin sustainable investment. Population growth, resource scarcity, and climate change. So according to the United Nations, by 2050, we are going to be 9.6 billion people in the planet. It's, a, it's a, an incredible amount of people, lots of people, and the number is quite difficult to comprehend. However, the challenge is not in the number. The challenge is the fact that more than 60% of those people are going to be living in the cities. 
The challenge is about how we serve this growing, rapid growing population in the urban areas. To put this in context, um, in the 1950s, my mom was born in 1950, not long ago, in the 1950s, we had 750 million people living in the cities. Today, we have 4 billion people. So the amount of services and products that we need to deliver is extraordinary. And those are the challenges of urbanization, both for the developing and for the developed world. And to illustrate that, um, we have chosen two pictures. There is no prices for guessing the first picture, which is um, one of Delhi's old market. Uh, Delhi is one of the most um, densely populated cities in the world. The second picture is from the developed world. Two and a half million people use that crossing every day. There are no prices, but a fun guess. Would anybody guess where that is from? The second picture with the crossing. Two and a half million people use it every day, and it's the developed world. Any guess? Any guess? Come on. Tokyo, this somebody said Tokyo, that was a spawn on Tokyo. And it doesn't get more developed than Tokyo, that's it. So urbanization is a problem for both the developing world and the developed world. In the developing, developing world, we have rising living standards from um, the emerging uh, middle classes. And in the developed world, the middle classes are moving to the cities, the good jobs are in the cities, and so on. We need to deliver more with less. And I said, we need to do it because of regulation within a carbon constrained environment, manufacturing and, and cutting uh, carbon emissions at the same time. Climate change, um, from an investment point of view, it gives a very good baseline of regulation to what company needs to do, how they need to operate and do businesses. And I do wonder if we are still debating if climate change is man-made or is a result of nature. And I know that scientists still are. However, investors are not. And we haven't debated for a long time. And the reason is that from an investment perspective, it doesn't make any difference to us. Either way, you are going to have companies that we can finance that are going to provide solutions to the problems of a rapid growing population where we need to deliver more with less and where we need to cut uh, carbon emissions solutions to the problems of um, the destructive power, power of water, providing coastal protection, uh, flooding control, environmental studies, and ensuring that the water that it gets to your house is safe to drink, and so on. And also, um, this new economy that is developing, the more with less and less carbon emissions, is um, illustrated by the fact that we all know that resources are very limited. Um, those two pictures in there that we have chosen to illustrate are about wastage. We um, have limited availability of resources. What do you do to make it uh, last for longer? Um, you need to become more efficient. You need to cut your waste. You need to find alternatives, but particularly become more efficient. And I suppose that beyond the uh, amount of waste that um, it goes into, uh, that we wasted of food every day, I think that the figures for the um, average British household is something like we waste 30% of the food that we, uh, that we buy. Supermarkets waste something like a quarter of the food that it gets into their stores. So there is a lot of wastage. How do you um, improve that? Companies providing better packaging, companies improving the distribution channels. Companies ensuring that um, the supplier gets closer to the supermarket. Companies recycling the packages that's wasted, ensuring that what you eat is, is safe and so on. Beyond water, beyond food, take energy, for example. The International Energy Agency has highlighted that 50% of the available fossil fuels has, have already been consumed. They have already been depleted, so therefore, we need to ensure that they last for longer, that we use them better. You and I, we will still drive a car. What do we do? We ensure that the car, the engine is more efficient, that it emits less carbon emission and it consumes less petrol, but it still gets you from A to B. And social mobility without transportation, it doesn't exist. People ne need to get to the good jobs. Um, what do you do in your house? You insulate your house. You pay for better energy and um, efficiency lighting. And you do it not because you are 
environmental and you are green. You do it because it makes it different to the, the energy bill that you pay. It has an economic sense and an economic value. And when it comes to manufacturing of any product, I think that more and more companies are focusing on productivity gains, on improving processes and so on, in order for these resources that they are very limited to last for longer. So overall, you have three macro drivers, population growth, resource scarcity, and climate change, and the pinning a cleaner and more efficient economy. So that takes me back to the investment part of sustainable investment. For us, sustainable investment is identifying and investing in those companies that are going to deliver that new economy. Those companies that are providing the products, the services, the technologies to improve the water shortages, to improve the imbalances that we have between supply and demand of energy, of food, of water, to reduce carbon emissions, to deliver central power where we need it, and so on. So um, that's what we understand as sustainable investment, identifying the companies that are offering the solutions for a cleaner and more efficient economy. How this um, framework, this thinking, translates into portfolio mani management, which is what um, we do every day. We have identified five investment themes. They are low carbon energy, food, health, resources, and water. We have identified around the world something in the order of a thousand companies and they are part of the value chain of these themes. For example, let's take the car. It doesn't have to be the manufacturer of the electric car. It could be the uh, manufacturer of this very specialist battery that you need for this car to move. It could be the one that provides the electronics that you need for this engine to be more efficient. You need connectivity to the power um, grid, and therefore you need services and infrastructure related to that. So those are the companies that we are looking to invest on behalf of our clients. And a thousand companies is around the world is very diverse across sectors, across regions. It gives us from a portfolio construction point of view um, availability uh, for us to move across the economic cycle and decide, and decide where are the best opportunities on behalf of our clients. Um, I do have and it's live for each of the themes. And because it's only 20 minutes, I think that I probably go into um, flick through them, but I'm going to highlight several key points that they are similar to all of them. And there are three main things that um, are similar for all of the themes. When you access opportunities, investment opportunities in any of these themes, energy, food, health, <coughs> resources, and water, you are looking at uh, end markets that are growing faster than the economy. And as you know, in this very um, low interest rate environment, where even the fastest growing economy like China is decelerating, there we go, decelerating, um, is no longer growing at high single um, digits. Um, it's still growing fast, five or six percent fast, but decelerating. End markets that are growing um, high single digits or maybe double digits for the next three to five years are very appealing to investors. And um, it's the growth that is appealing to investors. And you don't need to be a sustainable investor. You just need to be a smart investor looking for the new investment opportunities on behalf of the clients. The other thing that these um, five themes and the five slides have in common is that regulation is underpinning either consumer adoption or the business model of these companies. And um, the other thing that these um, uh, slides and opportunities have in common is the access to the value chain and the diversification of investment opportunities. And if you go through them, they are all listed as investment opportunities on the right. Um, I also have company examples. What does it mean? What kind of company that we look at? And again, for the interest of time, and also because otherwise my compliance department is going to be very, very angry with me, um, I'm not going to mention the names, um, and, I'm, and I'm pleased. It doesn't mean that we own them today. It just means that 
Um, we've seen that at some point during the economic cycle there were good investment opportunities and we may or may not own them in our portfolios. Um, and the slides um, of the company examples haven't really been made for this particular presentation and I think that that is a, is a very strong point. Um, they are not um, ideas that you need to be environmental or green for, for, to become um, investable or make uh, sense for your portfolio. They are investment ideas that there might be in different strategies. We do run many different strategies across the risk reward profile of clients. So um, I think that that is a, very, is a very good example of how sustainable investment has become um, available to um, everyone. And we at Quilt Achievio use it as an opportunity for new resources and so on. So um, I'm going to flick through the five uh, slides about the themes and the company examples. And that takes you to page number 47, it says in there. Page number 47. How do we do it? What does it mean from a portfolio construction point of view? And what we found is that um, private clients and charities, um, normally, generally speaking, um, they need capital appreciation. They need an income to operate. But also, more importantly, during the downtime, they need capital appreciation. Nobody wants to wake up one morning and find out that your funds have halved. Um, so how do we deliver that for portfolios for our clients? We do it through multi-thematic investment, which we just discussed, the five investment themes, through multi-asset allocation. So we invest um, in different asset classes, equities, bonds, um, infrastructure, and so on. We do focus on uh, mid and large companies. And that, again, is a very important point. Because the environmental markets um, are normally misunderstood, and people think that you need to own obscure, very um, unprofitable companies. And that is not how we see sustainable investment. We identify companies that they are solid business models, that they are liquid enough um, for us to be able to reduce and smooth the volatility of returns over the economic cycle. So we do have a threshold of 300 million market cap. We don't invest in anything below that to ensure that there is um, liquidity that we reduce the volatility. We have um, a double tier investment approach, and it's the same approach that we have with any other strategy. We call it a double tier because it's top down and bottom up. Top down refers to the views that we have about the economic cycle and how those translate into portfolio construction, um, which are the regions that are growing the faster, and so on. And the bottom up, it refers to identifying the companies and the lion names that you have in your portfolios. So if you wear a car, when you open the bonnet, that is the top down, exactly what is it in there. I have a slide about our investment process. And again, one of the things that I wanted to highlight is that it wasn't um, construct for this presentation. Our investment process on the sustainability team, sustainable investment team, is exactly the same that we have for all our, uh, um, other strategies. We do have a very strong um, research team. Um, it's a central resource, 20 people researching sectors and companies and, um, and also collective funds, as in when it's appropriate for some of the strategies. We complement that with several investment committees, and they are mainly led by investment managers. So we are able to manage, in a way, the expertise from analysts and the practitioners. For example, I'm myself a member of our International Equity Selection Committee. And that means, from a practical point of view, that some of the ideas, investment ideas, from uh, um, these portfolios that we manage, they, they might become attractive to other strategies and other managers. And the other way around. Sometimes we, um, we are... Um, um, th um, we are drawn to uh, other people's point of view or ideas because they are being discussed in these investment committees. So it's a very good way of um, centralizing and collecting the expertise across the whole business. So um, we have talked a little bit about 
the thinking, the investment themes, how we put the portfolios together. Um, it's another way of um, delivering good returns for our clients. Why is it um, relevant to charities at all? And I think that more and more we have seen that um, charities, when it comes to manage their, um, their funds, to operate and to, and to, con to, to operate on a day-to-day -day and to continue to operate over time, they are combining what we called negative screening and positive screening. Charities for a long time, um, they have been saying, we do not want to invest in, and it can be anything, more likely to be tobacco, alcohol, gambling, um, armaments. So this is, is very, uh, it's very traditional to the way that money has been managed for charities. More and more we see that charities are saying what we want to invest in, the things that we want to see in our portfolios. And they are mentioning those sectors and technologies that sustainable investments focus um, uh, on. So I saw that I will give you um, a case study. This is a new, a new client. Um, we have literally signed this client in the last uh, few weeks. And it's a faith-based faith, um, charity. And um, the two millions are split into two portfolios, one for um, called general purposes, for general purposes, and the other one is um, to allow for all of the expenditure of the, the ministry. So it's for the day-to-day -day and so on. So both of them need capital appreciation and they need an income. And they came from a different manager. And the new trustees um, developed the new investment policy. And the investment policy was very inclusive, saying what they don't want to invest in and what they do want to invest in. And some of the things that they mentioned, and this is straight from the investment policy, environmental technologies, public transportation, healthcare, recycling and waste, healthy food, water supply, and infrastructure. And they are the core of our thinking on sustainable investment. They also say we don't want the tobacco, the gambling, alcohol, and, and, and so on. So very much the combination of the negative and positive screening to be able for the portfolio to reflect um, the values that are important to the charity. And one of the things about investment that um, people said, um, all sounds very good, I like it, what about performance? Um, and the question is, uh, do we pay a price? Do we get penalized for investing in a positive way? My answer is absolutely not. And I will say that um, the proof of the, of the pudding is in the eating. And I saw that I will show you our performance against the peer group. Um, and, and just in case, um, we are the blue line. So we have outperformed the sector over, over time. I, um, I think that sustainable investment um, is a very, it's a very interesting and why topic. I only had 20 minutes, so um, I hope that over coffee and over lunch we have the opportunity to talk about more. But let me just um, tell you the key messages that I think that I would love for you to take away today. And it's mainly about how are we at Quilt Achieve your think of sustainable investment, what it means for us. And it is investing in those companies on behalf of clients that are offering solutions to the very challenging time that we live in, to the environmental and economic challenges of urbanization and a rapid growing population. Companies that are delivering a, a cleaner and more efficient economy. Um, over time, we are very, very um, confident that you do not pay a price for it, that you don't get penalized in your performance. And more and more, sustainable investment has become something that is of interest to charities, something that allows charities to um, be uh, faithful to, to their financial and their social, social objectives. More and more, we see positive and negative screening coming together what you used to call the ethical screening, the negative screening, coming together with the positive screening and deliver what it is a very interesting portfolio that can perform um, over time. We um, are very passionate about sustainable investment. We would like to know what you think about it. Uh, so probably 
please do come and see us. Uh, many of us, and we do have a stand over there, we are going to stay for coffee and for lunch. We would love to have your views of what do you think about sustainable investment? Do you do it? Is it relevant? Please come and see us. Thank you. Thank you for your time.